This is an experiment to test the upgrade facility of Microsoft Windows operating systems. It also serves as a sequel to the original Chain of Fools video, as three additional Windows versions have been released since then. However, rather than simply upgrading the virtual machine through versions 8, 8.1 and 10, the entire upgrade process was redone from the beginning to address a number of shortcomings with the original experiment. Firstly, MS-DOS had to be installed. Instead of going for MS-DOS 5.0 as in the previous experiment, version 3.10 was selected. This release was contemporaneous with Windows 1.0 and should be a more accurate representation of a typical PC environment at the time. MS-DOS wasn't available as a retail product before version 5, it was only available when purchased with a computer, often with manufacturer-specific branding and customization. Unfortunately, there is no VirtualBox custom version of MS-DOS 3.10, so the version for IBM PC was installed, as it was probably the most popular at the time. This version calls itself IBM PC-DOS, and after partitioning and formatting the hard drive using the familiar FDisk and Format tools, the official installation procedure literally just involves copying the disks onto the root of the C drive. As well as a full operating environment, Windows 1.0 was also available as a feature-limited runtime with standalone applications. One such application is Aldus PageMaker, which was installed to examine how the runtime differed from standard Windows. PageMaker, along with Quark Express, dominated the desktop publishing market in the 80s and 90s, although it was typically run on a Mac. The limited runtime does not include any of the standard Windows utilities, and can apparently just be used to run PageMaker. Before installing Windows 1.0, the virtual machine was reverted to before the PageMaker installation to avoid any conflicts. The PageMaker and Windows installers are clearly the same, but for some reason Windows 1.0 doesn't work with the VirtualBox PS2 mouse emulation like PageMaker did. The interface is easily navigable with keyboard, however, and a distinctive red, yellow, pink colour scheme was applied via the control panel. On reinstallation, PageMaker detected the existing Windows installation and ran just as it had in the standalone runtime. Before proceeding with Windows 2.0, PC-DOS had to be upgraded to version 3.30 as 720k floppy support was required. The upgrade procedure again just involved copying the files to the root of the C drive and updating the boot sector using the sys command. Microsoft Word for Windows was then installed, but as it required Windows 2.0 and didn't come with a runtime like PageMaker, it just crashed on startup. Windows 2.0 was the next version installed, which supported PS2 mice and so was compatible with VirtualBox. It doesn't so much upgrade Windows 1.0 as overwrite it, but a backup copy of the win.ini file is kept, so the colour scheme was copied to the new win.ini file using Notepad. Microsoft Word ran perfectly with this version, and PageMaker ran on a movable window, although there were many visual bugs and it wasn't very usable. Windows 2 also came in two enhanced variants for later Intel processors called Windows 286 and Windows 386. Respectively, these could take advantage of the increased memory address space of the 80286 and the protected mode of the 80386. The latter was installed over Windows 2.0 and again the colour settings were copied over to win.ini. Windows 386 was very advanced, allowing several DOS programs to run in parallel thanks to the virtual 8086 mode of the 80386. Another program that was released for Windows 2 was ZSoft PC Paintbrush 1.05, which was a very popular graphics editor and was responsible for the PCX bitmap file format becoming an early standard for PC-based graphics. Microsoft Excel was installed and verified working, as were all the previous programs. Windows 3.0 was the first widely used version of Windows, and so was the first version most people from around then can remember. During installation, it automatically detected some of the Windows applications and created program groups for them. Most of these still worked, but Excel refused to run unless Windows was started in real mode. Due to the 32MB partition size limitation of PC-DOS 3.3, MS-DOS 5 was installed and the partition resized to 2GB. This cleared enough space to install the Microsoft Entertainment Pack, a surprisingly fun collection of random little games and distractions. This marked the first appearance of the now legendary Minesweeper, as well as the almost as legendary Ski Free, and my personal favourite Pipe Dream, which was actually created by LucasArts. Windows 3.1 detects a few more Windows applications on installation, and again keeps the colour scheme set in version 1.0. It includes a slightly updated Minesweeper as standard, so there are now two versions installed. As Windows 3.1 came with multimedia support as standard, drivers for the graphics card, CD-ROM drive and sound card were installed. The startup and exit sounds will be hauntingly familiar to many. To test the multimedia capabilities, an interactive game called Monty Python's Complete Waste of Time was chosen. As well as the hilariously anarchic game itself, it comes with a series of desktop enhancements, collectively known as the Pythonizer, where you can replace the desktop wallpaper, system sounds, and screensaver with a wide variety of silly themes.
Also, in a surprisingly anachronistic turn, Microsoft made Internet Explorer versions up to 5.0 available for Windows 3.1. This was installed in the hope that it would confuse later versions of Windows, which came with earlier versions of Internet Explorer. Windows 95 was a simple install as it was the first version of Windows that a significant number of novice users were expected to upgrade to themselves. The colour scheme was kept, as was the sound scheme which still used the default Windows 3.1 sound. The program manager groups were converted into start menu folders. Most of the Windows 1.0 and 2.0 applications ceased working at this point, but Monty Python and the Entertainment Pack still came up no problem, as did Internet Explorer 5, despite not being the Windows 95 version. Microsoft Word and Excel were upgraded to version 2.0 and 4.0 respectively, which were still obsolete by Windows 95 standards, but worked flawlessly, even opening old documents without issue. In contrast to the previous experiment, an upgrade version of Windows 98 was available this time, so the installer could be launched straight from Windows 95. The only difference of note is the presence of stock photos on the installer screen, which presumably only appear when running with a sufficient resolution and colour depth. Everything worked in Windows 98 much as it had in 95, although there were now two copies of Internet Explorer, version 4 for Windows 98 and version 5 for Windows 3.1. Bizarrely, only the Windows 3.1 version worked. Note the channel bar featuring several very out-of-date website links. Now, there are two possible upgrade paths from Windows 98. Chain of Fools 1 went via Windows 2000, as this was chronologically the next Windows version. However, it is also possible to upgrade via Windows ME, as this was the next consumer-grade Windows version. The latter path was chosen for this experiment, just to see if there were any major differences. Apart from taking even longer than Windows 98 to install, and very much longer than Windows 2000, and having an apparently unskippable introduction video, the ME install was very similar to Windows 98, except the channel bar disappeared. All of the previous settings and applications were kept, and worked as they had in 98 and 95. Although it's technically possible to upgrade ME to 2000, this is not an officially supported option, as Windows 2000 was released before Windows ME. The next operating system to install is therefore Windows XP. As XP required more disk space than was available, the partition was converted to FAT32 using the built-in Windows ME utility, copied to a larger virtual hard drive using Clonezilla, and then resized using GParted. After testing the ME still booted and detected the larger hard drive, the XP setup was performed. XP was the first version of Windows to ignore the colour settings and startup sounds from the previous versions, but still had all the start menu folders and most of the apps installed since Windows 3.0 still worked. Bizarrely, without explanation, the Windows 98 channel bar reappeared, despite that never being available for XP, and even more bizarrely, PageMaker started working again, which must mean that Windows XP has better backwards compatibility than Windows 95 did. Chain of Fools 1 established that Vista and 7 don't keep any colour settings or similar from Windows XP, so no new settings were applied. However, the drive had to be converted to NTFS before Vista would install. Backwards compatibility in Vista and 7 were of a similar level to Windows XP, although PageMaker stopped working again, so that particular glitch in the matrix was resolved. Although both Vista and ME were unpopular, Windows 8 was probably the most reviled of all Windows releases, thanks to Microsoft's focus on the new touchscreen-oriented Metro interface in an ill-fated attempt to corner the tablet and smartphone market. While the installation process bore a lot of resemblance to the Vista and 7 installers, the actual user experience is completely different. At first glance, it didn't appear to have kept any applications at all, and switching to the desktop mode revealed that there is no traditional start menu. However, the All Apps function of the Metro Start screen revealed that the old program groups were in fact present, and compatibility was on a similar level to Windows 7. A pink colour scheme was applied to see if that would survive the next upgrade process. Windows 8.1 was released a year after Windows 8 as an attempt to address some of the criticisms, but on startup it was apparent that not much had changed since Windows 8.0. The pink colour scheme was kept and all the old applications worked. Finally, Windows 10 was installed simply by leaving the room. After 10 minutes it had magically installed itself. The start menu was much more useful in this version, and Microsoft's renewed focus on the traditional desktop paradigm was very apparent. However, the pink theme applied in Windows 8.0 had disappeared. As Windows 10 was the last version of Windows to be installed, the hard drive was examined for remnants of earlier Windows versions. There were far more miscellaneous files than can be covered in this brief video, but among the more interesting discoveries were a whole host of programs left over from Windows 2.0, as well as some graphics and other media files from various different Windows versions. Application compatibility was still excellent. The now ancient versions of Word and Excel still worked flawlessly, Monty Python's complete waste of time and the associated Pythonizer desktop enhancements were as fun and pointless as they had ever been, and the entertainment pack ran with no problems, even the oddball programs like Idlewild which do strange things to the desktop. So in conclusion, Windows backwards compatibility is still unrivaled, allowing nearly 30 year old programs to run flawlessly on brand new PCs. Certainly macOS can't boast anywhere near this level of compatibility, although to be fair to Apple, they did change systems architecture twice in the same space of time.
Thanks very much for watching this video. All comments and suggestions are appreciated, and I hope to produce some additional content around this theme shortly, so please subscribe.